What is the history of mankind, if not the continued pursuit of finding more efficient and effective ways of killing each other in a pursuit of wealth or power or ideology for the true God or for love? Besides having a bigger army or a better military strategy, having access to better weapon technology can be the determining factor, the difference between victory and defeat. And so throughout the centuries, especially during times of of conflict, advancements in weaponry were made, from more effective ways of killing one person to weaponry that could kill hundreds or even thousands, until in the midst of the 20th century nuclear weapons were created and over the next decades nations became equipped with enough destructive power to annihilate everything and anything on planet earth. There are few truly pivotal moments in global history but I think it is safe to say that the Manhattan Project, the Trinity Test and the subsequent bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was one of them. It was the end of half a century that was marked by two of the deadliest and most global conflicts in history and it was the beginning of the nuclear age where humanity would quickly develop the power to destroy itself followed by a period of cold war and many small proxy wars as all-out war between the global superpowers became too much of a risk due to mutually assured destruction. Many books have been filled with the history of atomic bombs in the Second World War and the consequences that it had on the world to this day. From philosophical arguments on the ethics of using or not using them to cold game theoretical analysis on deterrence and proliferation or non-proliferation used in international politics. These are immensely complicated topics and beyond the scope of this video. And of course many YouTube videos have been made in the past couple of weeks about the life of Oppenheimer. So I want to focus on something different. In his book Hiroshima the World's Bomb, Andrew J. Rotter chooses to dedicate his first chapters not to the Manhattan Project, but to the Republic of Science, the First World War and the ethics of poison gas, which is a connection to the atomic bomb that I want to explore in this video. Now, a central argument Andrew J. Rutter makes in his book is that Although the Americans got the bomb first, and the Manhattan Project was of course a highly secretive national project, it is a mistake to believe that the development of the atomic bomb was an American project. He writes, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima was not merely a decision made by the US policymakers in order to punish the Japanese, not just an issue of Japan-US relations, but instead the product of decades of scientific experimentation, ethical debate within the scientific community and significant changes in the conduct of war, all undertaken globally. Americans alone did not decide to build the bomb and neither did they actually build it. Although it was an American hand that released the bomb from the belly of the Enola Gay and while it was the Japanese that died that morning as a result, the atomic bomb was in an important sense everyone's offspring and certainly thereafter it was everyone's problem. Hence the uranium based bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was the world's bomb. As Rada explains, both before the first world war and in the years between the first and the second world war, the international and scientific community was open and transparent, exchanging knowledge and researching internationally without limitations between each other. And so it was also for physics and the exciting discoveries around nuclear fission and quantum mechanics that were made in the 1920s. Rother writes, the Republic of Science was a network of men and women with different backgrounds and differing values, who above all must work alongside each other and in full knowledge of what all its other members are doing. That the discoveries concerning the atom would be shared through journal articles, conferences and in coffee houses and taverns and labs was a matter of fate among the world's physicists before the Second World War. One could not patent or nationalize the atom. 
And before and after the First World War, this was how the international scientific community operated. Especially the 20s was a time where process and physics research increased exponentially with vast amounts of international exchange and travel between physicists with, at its heart, several universities in Germany. Oppenheimer wrote about this time, it was a time of collaboration between scientists from many different lands, a time of earnest correspondence and hurried conferences of debate, criticism and brilliant mathematical improvisation. In Munich's cafes, physicists would scribble formulas on the tabletops and waiters, for example at Café Lutz, were instructed to never wipe the tables without permission. It was a time where many of the world's leading physicists who would later during the war work on atomic bomb projects on opposite sides were exchanging their scientific findings. One of Oppenheimer's classmates in Göttingen was Friedrich Houtermans, who is described in American Prometheus as Oppenheimer's virtual contemporary as they shared similar social cultural backgrounds. Both got their PhDs in 1927. They shared a passion for literature and they were both in love with the same girl at the time, Charlotte Riefenstahl. Later, they would both work on developing the atomic bomb, but Houdemans would do so in Germany. Because despite the noble ambitions of international cooperation and transparent exchange of research across boundaries, this would end both during the First World War and during the Second World War as governments would demand secrecy and protection for any research deemed important for the war efforts. During wartime, many scientists would also no longer do research at universities, but instead be recruited by their respective governments to help develop weapons to destroy men in the name of national honor, security and purpose. You're not at university any longer. You are a very small cog in a very large system and you will do as your commanding officer instructs. Which brings us to the development and the use of poison gas. In World War I, many parallels exist between gas warfare and nuclear weapons that make understanding the history of the first insightful to understand the second. Because ethical dilemmas around weapon technology are not only defined by the deadliness of the weapon, but also due to its very nature. Poison gas created but a small percentage of the casualties of World War I, and as Rotter writes, gas protection technology advanced quickly beyond how urine-soaked sock. And so, with enough warning and discipline, soldiers in gas trenches could remain undamaged. However, what lingered was the subjective fear of gas, because it kills in a different way. Gas insinuates itself in the very atmosphere that people must breathe to live, destroying any boundary between what brings death and what sustains life. Unlike a bullet or a bomb, it kills quietly, insidiously, masquerading as something innocuous or even pleasant. A German infantry officer remarked that English gas was almost odorless and could only be seen by the practiced eye. Mustard gas smelled like horseradish, but but Germans would later mask it with the scent of lilac, and phosphine gas had a faint odor of cut grass. While it would not immediately affect those who breathed it, 12 hours later their lungs would fill. Gas was also hard to control, it could reverse directions and suddenly envelop the army that had fired it, and a German attack near Armentieres, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, caused 86 civilians to die and injured 600 others. The way gas killed was also particularly hellish, as a British soldier remarked after witnessing men dying from a gas attack. Their color was black, green and blue, tongues hanging out and eyes staring, one or two were dead and others beyond human aid. Some were coughing up green froth from their lungs. It is a hateful and terrible sensation to be choked and suffocated and unable to get breath. 
A casualty from gunfire may be dying from his wounds, but they don't give him the sensation that his life is being strangled out of him. To be sure, dismemberment by explosives, multiple gunshot wounds or burns from incendiary bombs are awful too and horribly painful, but the thought of suffocation, slow and uncontrollable, touches the deepest place of human fear. It is a primal, helpless death, one of betrayal by the silent, unbreathable air. It is slow, unheroic, panic-inducing and ugly. It is not unlike that by radiation. Of course, endless debates can be had about the nature of different weapons and which ones are worse ways to die from, but I do think that poison gas and nuclear radiation share similarities in their heinous nature. And rather rights as well, both weapons were in their times new weapons, understood by those who made them as unprecedented and possibly decisive in war. Both chemicals and chain reacting neutrons put weapons into a sinister dimension virtually beyond sight and sound. In trenches men blundered into undetectable pockets of gas, while radiation worked its deadly way undetected into people who thought to have escaped harm. And both weapons, even in their preparation, killed scientists who made them. Gas warfare and nuclear weapons not only share similarities in the ways they harm people, they also share similarities in the ethical questions that were raised around their creation and use, both by the scientists that created them and the governments that used them. As we know about Oppenheimer, he struggled immensely with the moral consequences of his creation, but he was not the first nor the last scientist to do so. And with regards to the poison gas compounds used in the First World War, many scientists who worked on it struggled with the consequences of their creations. Now, it is important to note that the use of poison gas in war was already in violation of the De Hague Convention of 1899, which was signed by all countries attending except the United States. Nevertheless, in World War I, gas was used by almost every participating nation. The justification the nations used for the use of poison gas were the same justifications that would later be used for aerial bombardments of civilian targets and eventually throwing the atomic bombs. Justifications such as if we won't, the enemy will, or the enemy has already used these tactics against us. As Rother writes, as they had done when Germans used gas, the British had claimed to be outraged when Zeppelins and Gottes rained bombs on English cities. Then they had done their utmost, as before, to retaliate in kind. The justifications for using the atomic bomb were similar too. Someone else, someone more barbaric, had attacked first. As Truman wrote about dropping the bomb, nobody is more disturbed over the use of atomic bombs than I am, but I was frankly disturbed by the unwarranted attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor and their murder of our prisoners of war. The only language that they seem to understand is the one that we have been using to bombard them. When when you have to deal with a beast, you have to treat him as a beast. Now the second justification for using all three of these weapon technologies and tactics was that in the end it would shorten the war and thus save lives. The calculations that the number of American and also Japanese deaths that a full scale invasion would cause was lower than dropping the atomic bombs have often been used as an important justification and so it was for gas. General Amos Fried told a Senate committee after the First World War, the more deadly the weapon, the sooner we will quit all fighting, make war terrible enough and men would never start it. The German scientist Otto Hahn was persuaded by fellow scientist Fritz Haber to start working on chemical weapons because the latter argued that ultimately the use of gas would end the war quicker and thus save lives. Of course, it is one thing for scientists to find rational and pragmatic justifications to work on weapons in service to their governments. It is another to read, hear or see with one's own eyes the pain and suffering and death that is caused by the creation you have worked on. Otto Hahn, who actually came face to face with Russian victims of a gas attack from gas that he had created, confessed to feelings of deep shame for his role in their death. 
gets. And Haber, who was so adamant in his justifications for the use of gas, for example, the fact that the French had fired tear gas first and in the end, chemical weapons would end the war quickly, was confronted by his wife, also a chemist, and she insisted poison gas was barbaric and a perversion of science. And one day, after their fight about it, she took her own life. The ethical obligations of scientists have always been an incredibly complicated matter. Ideally, scientists can cooperate internationally and are free to pursue scientific mysteries without having to weigh the moral and political consequences of their work. Idealistic science seeks only truth. Righteous or unrighteous causes do not have a place within the lab. Percy W. Bridgman wrote that scientists were only meant to seek the truth and then to publicize it. What politicians and policymakers would do with that truth was up to them and the societies they represent. He argued that if science was forced to be safe, free of any possible harmful applications, it would stifle scientific research. An experiment in genetics, for example, could be used by the state to enforce racist policies, or it can lead to a cure for diabetes. Bridgman argued that scientists had to conduct work without fear that the state would do the wrong thing with the result. Science must be immoral. Of course, this is not the reality of doing scientific work. Scientists often need governmental institutions and funding to do their work, and it is no surprise then that the state will take an interest and exercise control over the work that they do, especially in times of war. And it is during these times that it is no longer about how the state chooses to use amoral scientific research, but where scientific research is specifically conducted with the aim of advancing weapon technology and winning the war. And as Rotter writes, hadn't the physicists not taken it upon themselves to entreat the US President Roosevelt to authorize the building of the bomb? Was it not the international cooperation before the war years in the scientific community that made them acutely aware that the scientists on the opposing side also knew the explosive possibilities of nuclear fission and that the race was on. There were many strong and acceptable justifications for working and using the atomic bombs and as rather writes decent and humane by nearly all accounts, the scientists from many nations delivered to the US military the atomic bomb, knowing that it would be used against the enemy. And all of these scientists would face the difficult moral dilemmas around the creation and use of the bomb often coming to different answers at different times in their lives. Oppenheimer is of course famous for his quote, now I am become dead destroyer of worlds, as he watched the mushroom cloud in the New Mexico desert. But many other scientists who watched in the same moment the culmination of their work must have also grappled with the implications. And one scientist is quoted to have said somewhat less poetically than Oppenheimer, now we are all sons of bitches. Oppenheimer of course struggled for the rest of his life with his own legacy and in his own words the blood on his hands. It might be true that unleashing the power of nuclear weapons and the politics of mutually assured destruction that followed has made the world a safer, more peaceful place in the end, or that it at least has prevented a third world war. But as Michael Quinlan points out in his book Thinking About Nuclear Weapons, Principles, Problems and Prospects, there are significant threats to the concept of deterrence, such as political instability within nuclear power nations, escalation of conflicts, accidents and miscalculation or miscommunication, as almost happened of course during the Cuba crisis in the 60s, and terrorism. And if the day comes where one of these threats spirals out of control, it might indeed set the atmosphere ablaze.